Hi, this is Marcel. It is today is the 5th of March. Um, it's Iron Man Day here in Port Elizabeth. We've had some lovely stormy weather. The start was delayed for 30 minutes because of lightning. So it's been quite an exciting Sunday to start off. And we are about a week to go into the start of semester one, which is the 13th of March. This is your week one, lecture two, or learning event two, after the opening and welcome. So without further ado, let me share my screen. Okay, here we are with our PowerPoints. Let's get slide share going. There we go. This is Stadio brand and I'm ready to start now. Yes, so we are in week one, 2023, and we look at principles of English teaching methodologies. We can actually look at seven principles uh, based on CAPS and they're also in Ferreira. And if you look at the image on the left, it says English is fun. Um, Let's keep um, our English classroom full of fun and enthusiasm so our students will love coming to our classes. I came across this little um, quote, which I thought was quite nice. The first steps in making your lessons more relevant to your students' lives, how do we make our lessons relevant to our students' lives, is getting to know your students. And I thought that's going to be something I want to quite do quite nicely this semester. And we started with our online tracking um, activity, which is a reflection essay. You can write about 500 words telling me more about you, um, but I'm going to go into that just now. Let's, let's see where we're going now. Okay, for those of you who haven't yet listened to my opening and welcome um, introduction, this is who I am. I am Dr. Marcel Heron, and you can always find me in my email box at marcelh at stadio.ac.za. I try and get back to my students quite promptly. So if you really have got an important or urgent issue, please get back to me. Okay. And as I said, English is fun. Learning is fun. I'm sure it is. And always be excited about it. If you're excited as a student, as a lecturer, if you're excited as a teacher, if you're excited as a learner, things can really start happening. That's where the magic is. Again, your prescribed and your recommended textbooks. Um, the CAPS document there is Department of Basic Education. This is the um, home language grades 10 to 12, the FETs. But for each of you on Canvas, I've already uploaded your CAPS document for you to go through and to become familiar with, as well as um, your prescribed reader, which is um, Ferreira. I refer to Ferreira all the time, so it's a basic thing that goes along with any PowerPoints and all my learning events and everything I say. Um, you'll need it for your assignments, so it's, I think it's really good text to have. If you can get a second-hand copy from someone, that'll be fine too. The recommended text is um, from Clean. It's a 2015 edition, and as I said in my welcome video, this is about CAPS. It's got a lovely chapter one on CAPS, and it's also got quite a lot on assessment, not just for English, but it's generic, it can be applied to any of your specializations. So it's really a book worth having. There is our Anna Ferreira, um, 2009, it is a bit dated, doesn't have much of caps, that's why I've recommended the clean book, but um, it's, it's really sound in pedagogy um, for teaching languages, um, for practical application in the classroom, using all the skills, reading, writing, listening, speaking, assessment, it's got, all in Anna Ferreira. And there's your Aroy Clean, um, and finally your CAPS document, the three main things you need. Yes, um, your online tracking, I will give in, be giving you a clip of this every time I speak to you. And you can see there's all the, the headings there for the different online trackings. There are 10 of them this semester. I did a quick check to see how many FETs there were. Um, on Friday, there were 34 fell that were um, registered. This is normally about 90 of you are normally registered, so maybe a few more will for home language FET 56. Also about 90 usually, so maybe some more will still register. SPs are 66 and they want about 120, so you'll see how the numbers go, but those are the current numbers who have registered at this point. Um, there you can see your first online tracking um, task is your reflection um, task where you're going to write and tell me about yourself in 500 words. Okay, I'm getting to know you. Yes, there's my happy face when I see high student high, high totals. I um, mean, you have about 10 days to complete each online tracking. So 
there's time for you to get to it and um, I feel happy when that happens. Don't feel so happy when no one is. And then I normally put it in red so you'll see how I'm feeling then as well. Yes, just have a roundup of what your introduction and welcome tasks were. Uh, you can see there's three informal surveys. They don't come from marks. It's just for me to see how you're feeling with the mentee.com. There will be a few mentees. There's going to be one next week as well. And then there's the Kahoot quiz, which is a quick 10 question to see how well you listened to the introduction and welcome recording. And then an answer garden task. I'm going to show you what that is now. There's a different task for SPs and for FETs. And then, of course, your online tracking task, your reflection task, when you're going to tell me a bit about yourself. So if you go to your Canvas Quick Links 1 um, for week one, there you can see access over here. You can see there's your Menti task. You just click on the link and you'll go through to Menti. Here's your Kahoot quiz. Just click on the link and you go through to the Kahoot quiz. Um, you can do it more than once, I think, as well. And here's your answer garden. List five activities to develop your vocab. This is for SPs. I'm going to show you an example of what it looks like now as well. And there's your online tracking reflection task um, where you're going to introduce yourself, tell me something about you um, in 500 words. And I'm asking you to put an image of yourself, a picture, imagery, anything that represents you if you don't want to put your picture. But it's always nice to see my students' faces when I don't have access to you in real life in contact sessions. Okay. So let's just look at the answer garden example quickly. Um, the FETs have to look at find, give me five elements, list five elements in answer garden. And now you would analyze an advertisement if you were going to set a task, whereas the SPs are going to give me five activities they could use to develop vocab, for instance, brainstorming. Okay. And I will then go into answer garden and I'll share this with you in my next learning event in week two. Um, this is for the FETs. You can see the, the word count will show the most response in the biggest um, font size. And there's the intended reaction that the advertisement wants to get from you. Um, it could be um, who is included in the advertisement, why they use certain colors, um, what medium was it, what did they use, was it print, was it digital, um, what, what images were used in the advertisement and so on. Whereas the vocab, answer garden looks something like this and you can see crossword puzzle was one chosen the most okay and as they as the fonts get smaller those are the least um for instance i've got to describe a scene was only one person put that down okay so it's going to look something like this and i will show what comes through from, from the fets and what comes through from the sps as well right let's look at unit one where we're starting um, we're looking in week one at principles for language learning and teaching as, as um, depicted in caps. And you'll see that's in Ferreira's chapters one and two. You can refer to those chapters. And then as the weeks go by, we'll go into the, the other units um, themes. Um, next week, week two is going to be the curriculum documents and the caps document. Then the third week, we'll look at CLT, communicative language teaching methodologies. And then we're going to look in fourth week, um, lesson plan design. Okay. And then assessment finally. Yes. And now you are as your teacher. What kind of teacher are you? You can see this is a very inviting teacher, very open body language, hands outstretched to embrace her students. She's obviously doing past tense, walked, talked, needed. I would have liked to have seen students actually there. I'm writing on the board, their past tense words. Um, it's quite an isolated grammar exercise because I can't see any text. Um, Caps would want you to have a text. These words would have to come from maybe a newspaper report, a magazine article, where they have identified different past tense words, simple past tense. Okay. Right. Um, if you go to Ferreira, page four, um, this is what she says an effective teacher is. Okay. And you must think about all the time, what are you as an effective teacher? So the first point she says, you've got to be warm, approachable, with a sense of humor. So that means students mustn't actually be scared of you. They must enjoy going to your class because you're a bit funny, a bit quirky maybe, and, and that makes it quite appealing. My um, granddaughter, she's in grade seven now, and she, her best teacher was, teacher had her good sense of humor. So even from the grades, they're like teachers that are a bit funny. Okay, consistent in manner, that means you're not changeable. Um, that your students know when they walk into your class that you're always 
approachable, you're nice, you've got a good sense of humor, um, and you're not always cross and angry. Don't be cross and angry one day or strict, and the next day you're very lax. So rather be consistent in the way you're treating your students. If you're strict, be strict all the time. All right. Um, depends on what your personality is. Okay, I, I don't really think strict teachers are needed. I think it's teachers that need to manage their classes a lot better. That you cater for different learning styles. Um, some people are visual. Some people are um, more verbal. Some people are more into kinesics. They like to touch things. Um, so we have different learning styles in the class and to be aware of them. Be aware that you have different cultures in your class um, from different parts of the world, possibly from different parts of the country, from different, different groups. Um, and just realize that there are different cultural um, issues that you might need to be aware of, um, how you look at people, how you speak to them, what you call them, what words you use, and to be very aware of that because it can be quite offensive and insensitive if you're not aware of different cultures. Um, for instance, tonight the UAE, UAE, I shouldn't go and shake a man's hand um, to be aware culturally what is right and what is wrong. Also know that your students don't all have the same economic resources. They all don't have laptops, internet, um, iPads, iPhones, um, smartphones at home. Maybe they all do, but don't assume anything. Okay, I'm not going to assume anything either as well, so don't assume these things. And that there will be diversity, language diversity in your classroom. Some students, it might be their third language, English. It might be the second language. It might be the first language. So just be aware that there's a whole range of language proficiencies within your classroom as well. Okay, makes you an effective teacher for language. There we go. So let's see, what kind of teacher are you? Are you an angry, frustrated, anxious, stressed, and overwhelmed teacher looking something like this um, with the ruler in your hand, your finger up? Um, obviously, it's a maths teacher. English teachers just don't do that. Um, and that is that going to bring out the best in your learners? You need to think about those things as well. Or are you miserable, tired, bored, sad, and apathetic as a teacher? Okay, your students are yawning, they're looking out the window, they've fallen asleep on the desk. Um, be aware of the signs, and if you see the eyes getting all glazy, you know you've lost them. Maybe I've lost you already as well. Or are you a teacher that goes on and on and on, wow, 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 and Lucy's saying to Charlie Brown, Psst, did you get any of this? Okay, be aware, be in touch with your students, know what's happening, read the signs. Are they bored? Are they listening? Are they leaning forward, interested in your lesson? Are they leaning back, heads on the desk, sleeping? Be aware. Or are you this joyful, excited, enthusiastic, happy, motivated type of teacher, satisfied, you focused, you've got content, and you engage with your students, your arms are out there, you bring them in there at the board, they are possibly going to be writing on the board. Um, it's going to become an integrated, interactive type of teaching. Are we you all involved in the learning process? Something like this. You're sitting with your students. You're not sitting away at your desk, apart from them. You're circulating. You listen to what they're saying. You're smiling at them. You're making eye contact or not making eye contact, depending on what's applicable. Um, but those are things that embrace your students and draw them into the learning process. And that'll make... The effective fall to low in your class, that means they're not going to be nervous or scared. They're going to want to learn, and then they can learn as well. So what is your teaching style? Are you like this? You stand in the front, you're the lecturer. It wants it passively in your class, sitting straight up, not saying a word, while you wobble on. Or are you this teacher that comes down to the level of your learners? You invite them to answer questions. You're managing the talking um, they say a teacher should speak 20% in the class and the students 80%. Are you encouraging them, them to speak more, giving them time in groups, giving them time in pairs to share, um, and you are not dominating the whole classroom all the time? Okay, think about it. So today we're going to look at what CAP says um, in terms of learning outcomes. There's four of them for both FETs and SPs. We'll look at those quickly. Then we're going to look at the learning principles. Remember I said there's seven of them. Yes, we've got to get through seven quickly. Um, first one is that we always use texts. We don't teach in isolation. We don't just go and write words on the board. We actually have a text that goes with it. We bring in an article, we bring in an advertisement, we bring in a note, we bring in something that they've got to listen to. So we use texts to teach. Um, we use skills in an integrated manner, and these are all the skills we've got. We've got listening, we've got understanding, talking, writing, and reading. 
and we use them all together. We don't just use listening. We use listening and reading and writing and understanding. Um, they are integrated in the classroom. I know this happened last time. I'm going to try and go through it. Let's just see if I can get it to move. Here we go. Also got to read and view text critically. We must not always just take them at face value. We've got to be critical of the words that have been used in the text. Why did they use that negative word? Why didn't they rather use this word? Why did they use watch and not see? Um, why was it this different? So to be able to be critical of what we are reading about, and this often comes up in comprehensions and how we view advertisements, cartoons, and things like that, to say why we believe something. Then we need to mediate and scaffold learning as a teacher to help guide them, to mentor them, to facilitate learning. We don't just leave them independently to get on with it. We actually provide the scaffolding so that they can start understanding the learning process. Yes, and we can also teach them learning strategies, language learning strategies, so they, they know how to, once you've scaffolded them, they know how to do certain tasks. They know how to look for information by skimming. They know straight away that surveying will help them see this kind of information in, this is what you do for brainstorming, this is what you do for mind mapping, this is what you do for summary writing. We equip them with these strategies so they know what to do. We're going to be learner-centered, and that means if we use a CLT, communicative language teaching process, and um, we're going to be looking at that in detail in week three, it is learner-centered because you're encouraging your learners to use the language authentically um, in real activities. And that means you can't talk, they must talk. So you becoming more learner-centered. And finally, we're gonna look at assessment. We look at what formative assessment is and what summative assessment is. So we've got seven things to get through. Let's get started. Yes, there's your tick for getting it all right. Let's just look at the CAPS document. This is in all your documents on, I think it's page two, um, there's the first additional language and there's the English home language. They've all got this paragraph in it and I'm going to magnify it. Yes, here we go. And we're especially going to look at the sentence two. What is language in, when we teach it? So learning a language is to use language effectively. So if you have learned how to use a language, you can use it effectively in any circumstances. And sometimes we can't do that. We, do, we make a mess of it. So Learning to use the language effectively enables the learners to acquire knowledge if they learning language effectively, to express their identity, who they are, their feelings, their ideas, to interact with others and to manage their world. So if they've got language, they can do all of this. They know who they are. They can use language to interact and to manage their world. Interestingly, also, if we've got, if we are knowledgeable about language, it is through language that cultural diversity, we can address cultural diversity, social relations are expressed and how we construct them through language. And it is through language that these constructions of identity can be altered, broadened and refined. So this is the power of language, what it can do. It makes life clearer than it is, okay? Because we can use language in our social relations we can construct relationships. We can construct how we see the world just by using language. And we can affect others with it as well. Think about that. Go and read this paragraph again. There we go. Okay, let's look at what um, Cap says about the different outcomes for grades R to 9. We're looking at this for the grades 8 and 9. So this semester, we're going to first of all look at listening and speaking. And according to Cap's for grades 8 and 9, this is how to get information for enjoyment and for a range of context. So you are looking at information and enjoyment at the same time. We're also going to look at reading and viewing this semester. And that again, according to CAPS for SPs, as information and enjoyment. So you're going to read to get information, but you're also going to read to enjoy what you're reading. That's semester one. Then semester two, um, we're going to look at writing and presenting factual and imaginative type of writing. This can be your transactional writing, which is going to be an email, which is more factual, and then possibly your narrative essay, which is more imaginative. So the different types of writing that we're going to look at in semester two, and then we're going to look at language structures, um, critical language awareness, um, convention sounds, words, how we create them, how we interpret text using language, 
and that's all going to happen in semester two. So if you look at SP, it's basically to get information and to enjoy listening, speaking, and reading. And then the writing part in semester two is looking at the different types of writing and using language again to critically look at different texts. Let's how different is the FETs. Um, again, it's can you see speaking and listening? But yes, for a variety of purposes. Why do we listen? What kinds of listening do we need to do? What different audiences do we have and what different contexts? So it actually takes it to the next level. Semester one, we'll also look at reading and viewing it's for understanding and to evaluate critically a range of texts. So we can look at all kinds of texts. It'll be from drama to film study and how we can be critical of those texts all in semester one. Semester two, again, writing and presenting for a range of purposes, range of audiences, using various conventions and various formats from email to formal letters to um, dialogues to directions to lists to discursive essays to narrative essays to reflective essays, all the things we're going to look at. And then also looking at language structures and conventions um, that we use them appropriately and effectively, like when you're writing a formal letter, what kind of language structures do we use? If you're writing a friendly letter, what kind of language structures do we use? And that's all going to be in semester two. Okay. Right. So CAPS wants students definitely to think critically about things, not just to take things at face value, to, to analyze the discourse that's been used and Think about the negative or the positive words that have been used. Why have they used the pronoun here? Why have they used the contraction here? Why are they using direct speech here? Why are they using indirect speech here? Why has passive been used and not active? All those things we need to think about as language teachers and lecturers. So thinking and reasoning is important through language to be critical of it. That means all of you guys and girls must put on your thinking caps and that might be hard sometimes and explained, CAPS explained is going to happen all the time. In most of my learning events, CAPS will become part of it because this is very important in CAPS. So let's look at first the text-based approaches. Remember I said you don't teach in isolation. Everything must be related to some kind of text, whether it is a chip packet in the playground or a quilting bottle in the bag, whatever it might be. So let's have a look. What kinds of media could I use in my classroom? Is it just print media that I can use? Or is it also digital media? All right, is it listening media? What kind of material will I use in the classroom? Sometimes it's just the textbook that'll be my media. Um, what text am I going to have? I'm going to have maybe brochures, advertisements, uh, article from the newspaper, um, a pamphlet, uh, an email, a list, a direction, a dialogue, all the things I can use as text in my classroom. And what visual material am I going to use? Am I going to use a cartoon? Am I going to use an advertisement? Am I going to use a film still? Am I going to use an image? Um, am I going to use a drawing? Am I going to use a flow chart, graph, all the things that I can use? Then again, what language structures, what form, what conventions, what kind of grammar, simple sentences, compound sentences, complex sentences, what kind of vocab am I going to use? and how I'm going to structure it together. These are all the, the critical things we need to think about. And then finally, why am I doing this? What is the purpose of writing this email? Why am I writing this report? Who's my audience? Is it just my teacher? Is it my friend? Is it my mother? Is it my granny? Is it my principal? Is it the police? Okay, so all those different audiences you need to think about. So let's just go on with Ferrer says on page um, 18 to 22, she speaks about um, text-based teaching and the kind of media we could have in our classroom. Um, in the modern world, yes, 21st century, there's many forms of media that we can make use of in the classroom, depending on your school's resources. Um, remember, not all students, schools, and ourselves have the same economic resources. So it depends on what your resources are. So you've got your print media, which is a book, comes from books, magazines, newspapers. There's lots of free magazines and newspapers all over the place. Go to the airport, you can find lots there or daily, we get a daily um, newspaper as well, which you can collect, get from your friends, take all these to your classroom. There's such a rich amount of stuff you can do with books, newspapers, magazines, headlines, captions, pictures, images, introductions, conclusions, um, use of font, advertisements, cartoons, all of those are in newspapers and magazines. 
We also have television and movies, which you can use recordings um, from that as well. If you're going to use it to show a clip of something, if you've got the right resources in your school, you've got projectors, you've got laptops, you've got all kinds of things you can use. Video games, lucky if you've got those. Um, music is always great. You use the lyrics. You can print out the lyrics. You can listen to the songs. Background music to writing also nice to use. Cell phones are great. Yes, um, they can just about anything if they like have their smartphone in the classroom. You can use a wealth of information using Safari, using Google, um, using links, um, lots of things to do with your cell phones. So there's also kinds of software that you can use, my answer garden, something like that. And if you've got the internet, you've got access to the world. You can do so much with Mr. Google as well. So just remember, there's lots of media forms, but there's also the chip packet in the playground that you can use. It's media. Um, there's also kind of go and do a garbage collection in the school and bring all those things and study them. Yes, just a, just a Coke bottle um, they could bring to the classroom. Um, Look at the advertisement. You can just look at the color red. You can see the different font sizes. Um, you can see the visual, the image, um, and you can do so much when you discuss this. Why is it personalized in bold? Why is Coke in red? Um, what is the message coming through? Who's intended audience? Um, those are kinds of things you could discuss if you're doing advert advertising. This was taken from a grade nine um, comprehension that I that I looked at it was in a rural school and the teacher selected this interesting article on the world's coolest underwater hotel room okay now if you think about the context of this and the school is this appropriate in terms of their experience their understanding of a hotel do they have that understanding do they have an understanding of fish swimming around outside the hotel room and being under the water. So is this the right context for a rural student? Will they have any understanding of what this is all about? Right. Would you want to go and stay in this underwater hotel? It would depend on your context whether you say yes or you say no. Okay. So think about what you use as your material. It must be relevant to their experiences um, and life experiences as well. Yes, I think <laughs> selfies and smartphones is something everyone has experience about. So... These are things that you can discuss in the classroom, which is the best selfie position. Um, why do people take selfies? Are they dangerous selfies? Um, I think the big thing is why do we actually take selfies? How, who's in a selfie? Why did you do that? Who are you going to send it to? All the things you can discuss about selfies. And then you could write a poem about selfies as well. And then, yes, you've got the... Um, You've got the cartoons as well, which there's also a wealth of visual material from that. Many students have not come across visual material. So this is something they need to be experienced and enriched with. Um, he has the State of the Nation address, the SONA with, with Cyril Ramaphosa, our president, um, and all the promises. And this is like a fuel gauge. Um, you can see MT, the E, and F is full. You'd have to discuss with the students. Also, again, maybe it's not their context. They would not know about empty and full in terms of petrol or gas. Um, but there's these promises full, right to the top, to the brim. Price of fuel at the moment, that's really a rich promise it's given us. But let's just see what the action is in the second frame. And then you can see the dial is on E. Um, so there's so much you can discuss here. Why have you got the same picture of Cyril in both of those? Um, what has changed in each of the, the contrast the two um, frames? What is in the one, what's in the other, what is the same, what is different, why, what is funny about it. Um, caricatures as well, those are things you could all discuss in that. And then you, you're giving them experience at analyzing and being critical about visual literacy. Okay. All right. Second one is integrated language teaching. Um, this combines and integrates different learning outcomes. Remember, we've got speaking, reading, writing, and language. Um, I think it's listening to, I say listening. And we need to combine them all. We don't just do listening only in the classroom. We do listening, speaking, reading, and writing sometimes. We try to integrate different learning outcomes within our teaching area. So let's look at an example of a poem, which is called Me. They love to speak about me. Um, you can look at names. What does your name mean? What are the syllabic parts of your name? Break it up. And so you can discuss the whole thing that's talking um, about me. Then you could look at a structure or a template for a poem about me. Um, it's called Happy to be Me. Blonde is my hair, blue are my eyes, 
I'm 90 years old and just the right size. My name is Marcel, and as you can see, I'm very happy to be me. And they could use this template and with their partners, they could try and fill in the words to make it funny, to make it serious, um, and discuss the whole structure of it. With that, you've you've read, you've listened, and you've um, composed, okay? So those are important things that you've done. So to integrate all of these skills, and there they all are, listening, speaking, reading, writing, and language, how can we integrate them all together in a lesson about a poem called Me? All right. The listening part, you could listen to someone reciting a poem. You could listen to something about how to write a poem. You could then speak about your ideas in a group or with your partner. You can read different poems. You can read each other's poems. You could write your own poems. And you could look at the structures. Were adverbs used in it? Were adjectives used? What nouns were used? Um, were any prepositions used? Was there any figurative language? And let's look at figurative language over here, um, where the simile is used quite nicely in this, and you could actually practice simile and writing poems together. This is me. I'm as colorful as a rainbow. I'm as cute as ligerish. I'm as fast as. I'm, I'm totally cool as. I'm as tall as a tree by Ada. And then you can look at the different words that we use, rainbows, ligerish, what is that? Um, I'm just trying to see what's underneath me here as a cheetah. I'm totally cool and amazing and I'm tall as a tree. So you could look at all those similes and they could write their own one using different kinds of similes as well. Okay, so you're combining all the skills as CAPS would want you to do. And so it becomes a more integrated access to different language styles. So what about when you teach onomatopoeia? Okay, what is onomatopoeia, you might say? Yes, she has a whole lot of examples like mumble, gasp, belch, warble, bam, splash, wah, ah. Okay, those are all examples. And onomatopoeia is a type of word that sounds like what it is describing. Buzz, whoosh, boom. But now how can you teach this in an integrated manner? Obviously, the beauty of onomatopoeia is you've actually got to say it. There's a lot of speaking there and maybe listening to what others are saying when they use these words. But let's see how else we can use it. Um, these are all the, the comic words that you could have in a comic strip. So you could give out cartoon strips to the whole class and they could look for all these different uses of onomatopoeia. Zip, lol, oops, bang. Okay, well, there they all are. Yes, yeah, so these are different themes you could use with onomatopoeia. And this one is when onomatopoeia attacks. And what happens, what words would you use if you're attacking somebody like pow, eek, oh, grr, whoosh. Okay, so it's quite nice. You could have onomatopoeia attacks, onomatopoeia loves, onomatopoeia hears, onomatopoeia plays, onomatopoeia rides. These all kinds of things you could have, and they could give you different words to go with that. Here's a typical example of a cartoon. You've got Garfield and Odie the dog in the second frame. He decides to push Odie off the, the table, I think it is. And there is a lovely example of crash, okay? as Garfield pushes him off. Um, he has another one also again as Garfield as well, and he's squish, he's flattening something. Yeah, Odie is very happy, you know, the dog breaks his tail, thump, thump, thump. Um, and there's the use of onomatopoeia there, and there's a ball bouncing, bonk, um, the use of words like that. So it's to look, identify, and actually use it, and maybe even design your own and add a few. What other ones could you add to this? There's examples of onomatopoeia, whoosh, squishy, thumb, whack, clunk, thud, bang, and you can get them to add 10 more to this um, to give all the examples they could possibly use. Three is critical awareness of language. Remember I said they're important to be critical of what you're reading, critical of text, critical of what we say. Um, so CAPS wants students or learners to engage critically with text. So if something's written, not just to accept it, to analyze it, to think about it, to be critical about it. So the, to, to challenge the ideas that the writer is saying, I oh, don't agree with that, that's rubbish. Or yes, I do, that's like really amazing because. So to challenge the perspectives of the writer, um, the values, the power relations, I don't agree with him screaming at that. He wasn't fired, he was asked to leave. So to be critical of those ideas that are coming through, that we have learners that come through that don't just accept everything, 
They, if they've got to sign a contract one day, they go look at the words very carefully to see what they are really signing, to teach them that to be that critical person. Also to express opinions. So why? Why don't you like it when you said that? Okay, um, ethical issues. Is that ethical? That using copy and paste, um, isn't that plagiarism? Um, let's think about this. Um, so to be critical of things that are corrupt and not correct in our country as well. Also to be express your opinions on different values. Yes, that's good. It's good to, to pay your debts. Yes, it's good not to copy. Okay, those are things that we need to express our opinions about. Or it's okay to copy if you're going to revise it and put your own words in, okay, whatever you might want to justify it with. So remember the all text, any text carries values, okay? You must think about the writer's got a value and then he's trying to put that over in his book or her book. It can be negative values. It can be very sexist where he writes. Everything in the article is about he. What about she's, okay? Racist. How are they using racistic language? Autocratic is very direct. It's telling you what to do. And it's judging others, saying things about other people. Or is the article very democratic? It's fair. It's caring. It's compassionate about people. Now, if you look at this word cloud, I've got a simple aspect of our life. We all like to laugh and giggle okay i'm doing that a bit now but if you look at the words we use around this um the word snicker or snigger okay those are quite condemning words if you say that about somebody you're not actually being very nice to them you've been quite mean if you say if you snigger if they are, say something okay it means you don't really agree with them and you actually putting them down or if you smirk that means you also don't agree with somebody and you're saying it in a horrible way However, words like laugh, chuckle, grin, giggle, titter are all more positive words you could use. We giggled at the joke, okay? So that it's a very positive thing rather than say we sniggered at the joke, okay? Which is a very derogatory way of looking at something. So when you read, you have to identify the values that are being expressed. What values does this writer have? How does this writer express these values? Is it very positively or is it very negatively? And ultimately, is this language used to empower or disempower someone? Am I making someone feel included or am I making someone feel excluded by the language that I'm using? So just to reflect on, have you ever felt excluded by language? All right, not being included. Um, possibly when someone speaks another language in front of you, which you don't understand, you feel very excluded. You think they're talking about you. Or if you walk into a group and they start laughing, you think it's about you. It's all about us, hey, isn't it? Um, have you felt excluded because of that? And yes, it's the image of someone going to UFS, um, the university there, and it says welcomes you, but everything about the image shows that she is not being welcomed, okay? There's a chain around the gates, there's wrought iron there, there's no way you can get in. So this message is totally at ends, doesn't suit what it's actually saying, okay? So sometimes people say things, but the way it's been said, you know that they don't, it's not believable and you don't agree with it as well. Social justice is so important in language teaching that you are aware that you are being just in what you're doing, that you're not being judgmental, and that you have the power to critically look at language that you're using and other people are using. When you're writing something, when you're reading something, constantly get your learners to reflect on language being used. Is it empowering? Is it disempowering? Is it including? Is it not including others? This is a very simple example about when you just greet others. Um, it says they avoid saying ladies and gentlemen or ma'am or sir or girls and guys because if you say ma'am can you presume that you're not including the masculine form of this if you're saying guys are you only speaking about boys or you're speaking girls as well so it says rather say thanks friends or good morning folks it's more inclusive hi everyone um, can I get you all something okay not you something all something and that's making it more inclusive because this gender inclusive language respects and acknowledges the gender identities of all people and removes any assumptions from that so we must be very aware of the language that we are using and not to use words that are not going to be inclusive of others just be aware of it when you say hey guys and you've got girls sitting in front of you shouldn't you say hi okay 
hi boys and girls but then you must be careful how you use boys so there's like always be aware of what language that you're using don't always say he 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 because remember there are he's and she's even if it's an engineer all right there are female engineers as well as female doctors as well as female male nurses yes so just be careful when you just don't acknowledge those different genders pronouns are also quite something to think about because you always speak about they did this okay that means they are not inclusive i am we and us all right but they are someone else so they are to be excluded put away from us so just be careful how you use your pronouns as well especially the i me us and they them they are the others so this little definition of what is non-inclusive language its definition says here it's any language that treats people unfairly insults or excludes a person or group of persons okay if you exclude someone and often when you speak with jargon you actually exclude others i'm just thinking about the golf a golf um golf course you speak about different irons and woods fairways tees um bunkers um fair the rough you use all these terms and someone might not know what you're talking about if they don't know the jargon. And there's medical jargon, there's social jargon, there's economic jargon, and there's all kinds of jargons that go with different kinds of subjects. So just be careful you're not, not including everybody when you start using jargon, when you're speaking about different things. Okay, let's look at mediating. We are number four now. It's a teacher who must support, guide the learning to make sure that it is mediated. You're helping your learners to learn. There's the scaffolding that goes up in the building. It doesn't stay there forever. We eventually take it down. Um, and how can the teacher do this? By giving the learners models, examples. E.g. it's an advertisement. This is what advertisement looks like. This is what I want you to look out for. This would be study here. This would be for fonts, questions. Um, those things are important. You ask questions and you get them to ask, ask questions. You give guidance on how to do things. You provide criteria. I want five, I want two, I want three nouns, whatever you want, you give them the criteria. You show them how to evaluate, you show them the rubrics, and you also get them maybe to mark each other's work as well. That is a good way to show them how to um, evaluate. You show them how to find key points. Looking in the topic sentence, you're going to find your key point here. Um, Look in your final sentence, you're going to find a key point there. How do you make lists? How do you start parallel structure in this? You show them how that's done how to read instructions. And this is something I need to help my students do. So for each of the assignments, I will unpack it by helping to you to read the instructions so you know what to do in my assignments. Yes, once the students can work independently, then you can take the scaffolding away. So you will help them initially as the teacher, guide them, assist them, show them, model for them, and then you can remove the scaffolding and they can do it independently. So this is quite a nice little image showing this. First of all, the teacher is all teacher. She models, he models, then guiding the learners. Mostly the teachers doing all the guiding, walking around, helping. Then the release, mostly the students, they might work in groups here and doing this together. And the independent, it's all the students work when they finally do the task without the teacher's help. And they've been scaffolded all the way to the top and then they can independently do the final product. Right, and yeah, something that I'm going to ask you to do, um, we spoke about the answer garden just now. Um, what strategies could you teach learners to develop vocab, read for enjoyment or analyze an advertisement? What strategies are you going to model as the teacher? And for the SPs, you're going to look at five activities to develop your vocab. What five things I've been mentioning, just brainstorming all the time, one if this will come up, but what other activities are there to develop vocab? For the FETs, what five elements are needed to analyze an advertisement? So if you're going to model or teach your learners to actually know how to analyze an advertisement, what elements must they look out for? Okay, and then you'll have that all on uh, Canvas, week one links. You can go and click on there and you can go straight to the answer garden. There's the answer garden, what it looks like. This is an example of what the word cloud will look like once you all have worked through it. Um, the question yeah, for the for the learners or the person competing it was, what makes you happy? And if you look at the word cloud, you'll see that sunshine and good coffee are prominent things that make people happy. Um, good coffee and sunshine make me happy. 
then it comes to family time and my kids, then my girlfriend, then having a sense of achievement, good novel, love, holidays, and so on. My dogs don't feature, but they're tiny at the side there. Um, censorship. My cats, also small. Kayaking. That, that might make someone happy, but it's obviously not making very many people happy. And there's running. So I want you to try and think about words. Five words. Um, sometimes only two words is fine, but try and think of single words, both for the um, vocabulary building and for analyzing advertisement. Okay, five strategies for learning. Yes, we need to support our learners so they can go on with the learning process without our constant support. Okay, so we don't want to have to be that that scaffolder all the time. They must become independent and we must give them the strategies to actually do that. So example, if we want to give them reading strategies, we're going to teach them how to read different kinds of texts. So we can teach them how to skim headlines for main ideas. So yes, this is my headline. What is the main idea? What This is my topic sentence. What is the main idea? We can teach them how to scan a dictionary, for for instance. How do you, you don't read every word in the dictionary, you go and scan the pages. How do you read instructions? Which words must we look at? So once they've got the, that knowledge, you might find that their strategies for reading will improve. Also, you, they can evaluate and improve their reading speed. Because remember, if you read very slowly, your comprehension levels go down. And if you want to go and check your reading speed, there's two sites to click on and go and check your reading speed. Um, an average reader will read at between 200 and 240 words a minute, and your comprehension with that would be about 60%. If you are a good reader, which is what our, um, our graduates need to have, as between 300 to 400 words per minute you should be reading, and that means that you're a good reader, your comprehension is 80%. Interestingly, if you're only reading 100 words a minute, your brain is just about frozen at that point, um, you're only going to retain 50%. And that means it's insufficient. You're not reading very well. You're not retaining what you are actually reading. If you read too slowly, your brain just doesn't, it freezes, and you can't actually understand what you're reading about if you're so slow. However, if you read between 700 and 1,000 words a minute, you have an 85%. So 300 to 400 is fine. You're a good reader. Um, but if you're reading faster than that, you're an excellent or accomplished reader. Okay, so strive for the 400 words a minute. Um, also to use content pages, the library catalogs, the different ways that you can get information um, to identify keywords and so on. So there are very different ways you can equip your learners to actually get information quickly when they are reading. Yes, you can read like this very, very fast. That's skimming and scanning. Well, oh, this is what happens when you read slowly. Yes, you fall asleep, your brain just dies there and you cannot take in the information. This is what happens often when you're studying and you're reading something very slowly, you'll find that you get very tired because your brain is so bored because you're reading too slowly at that point. So reading complexity is quite interesting. Um, adults normally um, read at 200 to 250 words a minute, but college students, as I said, should be reading at about 300 words a minute, faster. Speaking, we speak at 160 words a minute. I think I speak about 180, I think it's faster. Um, however, our thinking speed, our brains, this wonderful organ we've got is 1,000 to 3,000 words a minute. So that means even before I'm saying something, you know what I'm going to say, your brain's already processed it. So just imagine if someone's reading very slowly or speaking very slowly, your brain is going to get so bored, it's going to switch off this when you get the students get that glazed look on their eyes and they start daydreaming. They start planning their menus. They start arguing with the speaker in their heads. Um, so we give them lots of time to do different things because we are going too slow. The faster we read, the faster we speak, the more the brain can process and the more active the brain remains. Okay, Just by someone speaking clearly and well and fast, you can retain about 85% of what they have said. But if they're speaking very slowly and they're reading very slowly, you're not going to retain very much. So the important thing is to give our brain enough work by speaking a bit faster and by reading a bit faster as well. So what about reading complexity? What do we have to do to read? We've got to know the different sounds in a word. We've got to be able to sound them out. We have to be able to interpret those different combinations of letters like table. We should be able to see it straight away. Laptop. 
um, complexity, all right? So, and if you don't know the word, be able to sound it out, all right? If students cannot do this, if they can't put letters to words or to sounds, difficulties with learning and reading occur. And this is when they don't want to read, okay? Because it's too hard and they can't actually understand it. So they've got to actually know what every sound a letter makes and a word makes to be able to read more comprehensively. I think about um, the name of PE, Abeja. So you've got a click sound. Sometimes I get right, sometimes I don't. But the HA is also got a different sound. So if you do it phonetically, Abeja, okay, um, to understand how to say it, it looks like a different word to what it sounds, but it's through practicing and using the right sounds for the right words in the right language that enables us to understand something. And that's why a second and a third language the pronunciations might be different, which makes it quite difficult sometimes for certain languages. Um, I know Afrikaans has got the guttle rr, roi, ruis, okay? Whereas we don't do that in English. Um, the click sounds in both, I think, Koza, Isizulu, have all got the click sounds, which is quite difficult for a non-native speaker to actually do it. Um, I battle with that as an English mother tongue speaker. I'm not an Isizulu speaker, so that might be a bit difficult for me. Okay. Six. We've got to be learner-centered teachers, okay? And often by using the communicative language teaching approach, we become more learner-centered. Um, it's an approach to teaching language where the learner is expected to convey ideas and meaning rather than being correct in the way they use language. So if there's a Concord error and they say, I, I is going there, it's fine. You still know that they're going there. So you don't correct errors in language. That will come right in at some time but it's focusing that you can understand the meaning. If you can't understand what they're actually saying, maybe through bad pronunciation or the incorrect use of a word, um, then possibly there is an issue and you can actually say, look, I don't understand the use of that word. Um, you don't say, um, I, I see a form, you say, I watch a form. But I think if you said, I see a form, you would still understand what the person is saying. So this kind of approach, CLT approach, um, emphasizes using language for appropriate communication, talking to each other, various contexts, whether it's been role-playing an interview, going shopping, answering questions, performing a task, different task um, for social interaction. As I said, you can have a dialogue going between two people. So, but you're emphasizing the use of language. So students will need reasons to, to communicate. So you've got to provide them those, those reasons give them many, many opportunities to practice the language. That means, again, teachers, you don't have to speak all the time, rather get your learners to practice using the language. And there's something that you could do in your class. Everyone goes around the class and you could start a sentence fragment with saying, I'm so frustrated when, when my brother takes my book, when my teacher marks my work unfairly, when I'm hot and sweaty. Okay, so those are things that you could do. Or you could say, I'm so excited when, my granny comes and visits when I get a new iPhone. I'm so excited when I get full marks. I mean, those are things that you could go around the class and there's so many things you could do that every day you could have a little session or you could have groups where they have to do different, different sentence fragments and they've got to complete them. Or you can take, we've all got WhatsApp. You could have WhatsApp between the two of them. Um, the one can write one message, the one can respond to it, the other one can write another message. And you could have this little message going on where they are actually sharing information and responding to each other. These are different activity types that promote CLT type of um, activities in the classroom. Information gap activities when you don't have all the information you need it and you have to speak to someone to get it. Jigsaw activities when you put things together. Um, if you do this, I will do that. How are we going to do it together? When you've got to go and gather information, some kind of survey, how many people drink coffee, how many people don't drink coffee, how many people have got Ferrera. Okay, I do all my mentee studies like that. Um, you actually get information from other people. If you've got information transfer activities, um, I'm going to give you an invitation. How do I transfer that, inf that information to you? What about how to bake a cake, how to get to... A or B, how to get to the classroom. Um, those are kinds of information transfer activities, opinion sharing, debates, discussions, um, reasoning gap, um, murder stories. How do we fill in the gaps? How do we reason who actually did the murder, who stole the who stole the, the laptop, 
We can do all kinds of reasoning gap type activities. And we'll look at this more in week three when you go into CLT um, activities. All right, we're coming to the last one. Hallelujah. Okay. A formative and summative assessment. Um, summative is at the end of the course. It's like your exam time when you have to write that final examination. And this makes you to draw conclusions about the learner's knowledge, their understanding and their skills. So sometimes those exams are very important. All right, now let's see how much you all remember. Okay, for maths and accounting, it might not be very much, um, but those are kinds of things to be assessed in terms of summative exams. We do at the end of the course, so therefore often has limited value because the learners cannot improve once they have failed or once they have passed. You can't say, well, I wasn't happy with 60, I wanted 80. It's over, the test is finished, okay? Um, so they have to be accepting of that mark. Um, so that's why it's a final mark, but it only gives you assessment of how much they know or don't know, and you can't change marks because of that. On the other hand, Formative assessment is to improve learning. It's those little assessments you have all the time to improve the learning process so that you will have a very good summative assessment, um, which you will grade your students on ultimately. And this is quite a nice image as well, where how we get to the summative, it's the formative, the formative, the formative, where the student has got a chance to improve all the time before they get to the summative assessment at the top. So what about your assessments? Okay, let's have a look at that. I have shared this in introduction and welcome, but let's go through it again. And there's your SS1, Unit 1, so the CRT case study um, that you have to answer questions on. 20%, the SPs um, submit on the 4th of April and the FETs on the 6th of April. There are two different case studies, um, so you can't use the um, SP answers for the FET answers, they're two different case studies completely, um, two different tasks. And there's your others, your SS2, your SS3, all of this is on Canvas, you can go and check it out. So what's next? I can remember we're only in week one, we've got week two coming up from the 20th of March. Um, what are we going to do then? Um, if I think about what I've said, spoken to you about this morning here in Port Elizabeth on the, the 5th of March, um, yeah, we've got a cartoon, and you've got um, the first frame, the boy is saying, I taught Stripe how to whistle. Okay, Stripe is the dog. Second frame says, I didn't hear him whistling. I don't hear him whistling. And then he says, I said, I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. So often we can think we're teaching our students something, but learning it is a different matter. So this is when we've got to practice things take them through all the steps to get there, give them all the formative assessments to get to the summative, give them all the practice steps to acquire something so that when they go and do it independently, they will know how to find main ideas because they have been taught it and they've been practicing it as well. All right, so maybe you've learned nothing from this, but I've tried to teach you about it. And let's just go back one year. Just let's keep the joy in teaching and your enthusiasm going. Um, a smiling teacher is going to be a teacher that gets through to her class, or his class, um, not a teacher that's very terse and angry all the time, making their, their lessons relevant and thinking about these seven steps to make a very effective English teacher. And then we follow on with this with CAPS, looking at CAPS in week two, um, and as well as um, the, the CAPS documents and curriculum assessment and the national curriculum statement, all those things we'll be looking at next week. So that's going to be exciting. So have a good week, one more week to go, and we start semester one, and these will all be made available for you in week one, and so I'll be seeing you soon. Um, chat soon, take care, and have a good Sunday. Bye for now. Stop my share. Let's see, let's just try and stop it here. Stop share. There we go. There I am. Bye for now. See you soon.